Christine Horn, the Booking Magnet, and welcome back to another episode of Booking Magnet Magic. Ooh, this season has been amazing. And today, look at me, if you're looking at me, if you're listening, just listen in. I got to interview and chat with casting director Erica Breen. When I tell you, I feel like she and I could have talked for hours. Like we were just the vibe was just good. I really have nicknamed Erica the actor's advocate. You know, she's just like, she's really such a beautiful, bright, encouraging, helpful light in this industry. And I dare say we need more of that. Look, you can look up Erica. We're going to put all her links in the show notes. If you're not following her on Instagram, just go ahead and do yourself a favor and follow her. She's cast so many projects, most recently Ordinary Joe on NBC, Tell Me Your Secrets on Amazon, Altered Carbon on Netflix, and many, many more. You're going to love this interview because we're not talking about just how do I stay in touch with you with postcards or no? Like this isn't that conversation. We're going deep. We're speaking to the heart. We're speaking to the soul. We're talking about being courageous and sharing our opinions and what that means. And it was truly refreshing to speak with a casting director who just cares? So you're going to enjoy this interview if that means something to you. So make sure you tune in and enjoy this interview with Erica Breen. Oh, goodness, we're already laughing. So, you know, that's a good, good sign. <laughs> Y'all, I'm here with Erica S. Bream. I'm, I know you're casting director, but I feel like I'm, I also want to give you the, the title actor advocate, you know, and I like that title. Yeah. And as you say on your website, legit happy person. So welcome to Booking Magnet Magic. I'm so happy to have you here. Yes. So y'all in for a treat. I know I say that every episode, but you know, we're getting a, we're getting a different angle, a different perspective today. So I hope you really tune in. Um, Erica, let's just get into it. You know, how did you get started? In, in entertainment period. I know you started as a performer. I want to hear some about where are you from and how'd you get started? Sure. So I'm from North Dakota originally, um, you know, not exactly a bastion of film and television. Um, but I, uh, I had family on the East Coast and then every time we would go see my grandparents, we'd go into Manhattan and we'd see a play or a musical. It was usually musicals. Um, and so I saw my very first musical when I was three, I don't remember it. <laughs> you were told. Um, I, you know, I was there, apparently. But I hear stories about it all the time. Um, and my, we saw Big River on Broadway. And my my mom said that at intermission, I was, were, I was completely wrapped through the the whole first um, first act. And my mom said that at intermission, I just looked at them and said, is it over? And I was so sad. And I, 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 I feel like that was sort of been the precursor for my <laughs> entire artistic career. So I... I just was always a theater level lover. That's where it all started for me. Um, I did start acting in my school plays and school musicals and things like that. And I, I loved doing that. Um, but I just really didn't like auditioning. Um, I would get really, really nervous in front of my choir teacher, you know, just these yeah. super low stakes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just, uh, I loved being on stage. I loved collaborating. I loved performing. I just didn't want to be an actor. I felt like I just, I just didn't have it in me. <laughs> I'm not strong enough. Um, so I, uh, you know, just kind of went about my merry way. And I was watching a movie with my my grandmother um, when I was about 16 years old, and the credits rolled. I remember which movie it was. It was Hope Floats, mm-hmm. um, and the credits had casting by. Ronnie Yeskel. And um, I, my family's related to Yeskels. I have Yeskel cousins. Um, mm-hmm. My grandmother's sister married into a Yeskel. So um, that's where all that comes from. Yeah. So I, I asked my grandma, I was like, are we are we related to this person? And she was like, yeah, it's so-and-so's daughter. So that's your like third cousin. I don't even know. Like who knows what that cousin lineage is, but we are <laughs> distantly related. And just that sense of knowing somebody who does it and I didn't know Ronnie at all I didn't I didn't I had never met her at that point but having this sort of vague connection to something that was really interesting to me because it had to do with actors Mm -hmm. I was like okay 
I want to follow this line and see what happens. And um, I did research and, you know, at the time there was absolutely no education programs that were related to casting. There were, of course, film and TV and acting and whatever. So I went to film school and I just interned all over the place. I interned with different casting offices, with a, a network casting office during a pilot season, independent casting, voice casting, just Whomever would have me, that's where I went. And um, eventually I I graduated from the USC Film School and my very first actual job in casting was for Ronnie Yeska. What? Are you serious? Yep. So I had a very full full circle circle start to my career. Mm -hmm. And um, every, every job I have had has sort of come from a previous one. So my work with Ronnie led to the next thing. That next thing led to my work with April Webster, who I worked with for a really long time in mm-hmm. LA. Um, and everything just kind of spun off from there. So I, you know, I really do owe a lot of my start, A, to my grandmother, but also yeah. B, to Ronnie. Yes. Come on, Granny. Connect- I know. Connection. The best. Connection. Yeah. Interesting that you said you, you, auditioning made you nervous oh god but but you were on but on stage in front of people you were fine yes yes it was just I don't know what it was maybe you know maybe it's the darkness of a theater that isn't as scary um or maybe it's just the fact that I already had the role at that Mm -hmm. point that I didn't have to be so self-conscious about it but man I would get up there to sing in front of my peers and in front of my choir teacher and I would just start sweating to death. I wouldn't be able to breathe. My, like I had no voice control whatsoever. I mean, I was a mess. I was a mess. So I just, um, I, I just absolutely didn't enjoy that part of the process at all. Whereas I loved actually working with my fellow actors and students and stuff like that on stage. I loved spending my time to block and learn the, the music and do all of those things. I just really didn't like auditioning. It was, it was just made me <laughs> Deeply self-conscious and anxious. I already know the comments to this at this point of the video. It was going to be like, amen, that's me. That's the one in the chat right now. It, just, it makes me have a deep respect for what actors do because I know what it's like on a, like I said, a very, very low scale. Yeah. And man, I just, oof, bless I can, cut, I, bless I can relate to that too. You know, I was talking to my mother the other day and my mother, she's one of those people who's never met a stranger, but she's like, I couldn't talk. You talk to thousands of people, you know, you perform at thousands of people. And I'm like, mom, but I don't like, I've gotten better, but I, she made me nervous. I would never like to sing in front of my mom. Not that I would fear she'd judge me. It was just too intimate. Give me your, give me a stadium and I'll, cause it's, then I'm in my own world. I feel protected. I think there's that connection there. Yeah. When you were growing up, so cl- clearly you started, you saw musicals early. Who were some, even if you don't know the specific names, but what was it about some of the performers that made you lean in? Like who made you lean in and why was it? What was it about? So, so, I mean, when I was growing up, it was, um, <laughs> well, from the, the musical people, it was, it was the people who were in my uh, vocal range. <laughs> that <I loved. laughs> very aspirational. That I aligned very closely with. Um uh, those, you know, those, those altos and those mezzos, um, the, uh, but really, um, you know, I, we, I grew up on a lot of film and TV, a lot of it. Um, I, we, we always joke cause we have kids now. And of course, now that we're parents in the, in the two thousands, we, we all have to talk about screen time and things like that. Yeah. And I always tease my husband. I was like, listen, I watched a lot of TV and movies and look, look how I turned out. So <laughs> fine. <laughs> So I use it to justify that um, yeah. sometimes. But yeah, I, in terms of leaning in, um, you know, it took me really a long time to sort of appreciate the the art of casting, that this this is somebody who in life is not this, mm-hmm. right? That they they were specifically chosen for this role to inhabit this role. So, I mean, for a really long time, I just... Um, was lost in the actual performance and not thinking so much about this person speaks to my soul as a, as an artist or a performer. Mm -hmm. It was just a, I love this piece. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was, it was, it was a more broad thing. And then I think when I um, became more of a teenager, I feel like that the, one of the very first um, 
movies where I, I just was deeply aware of the casting because I think they were, they were about my age at the time was, um, the movie October Sky. It's really old now. I don't know. Well, I've been doing this thing where I go back and watch older movies with new eyes. So I'm at it. Totally. So Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal was the lead of that one. Chris Cooper plays his dad in it. Um, and it is a period piece. It's about, you know, the, you know, when they first started sending rockets into outer space and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just became aware of this person who was about my age doing this thing. And, and again, I think because it was a period piece, it had the, that more, it was a more obvious that it wasn't. You wasn't yeah, right. It wasn't it was, real in this moment. Exactly. And I just became incredibly aware of it. And that ensemble cast is so good. Oh my God. Chad Lindbergh's in there. Um, I'm completely blanking on the woman who played his mom, but she was just exquisite. Um, and it's just... It's a, it, it was the first time that I, I was probably 14, 14, maybe, something like that. Don't worry around that. Nobody do math, please. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I, I just had this, this awareness that they were acting, not in a bad way, not in a critical way as, as a, this is, this is an art form that's happening. So that, that was probably when I first became aware of all of that stuff. And then soon after um, was the Baz Luhrmann Romeo and Juliet with Claire mm -hmm. Danes and Leo DiCaprio. And that movie, I think for, for teenagers who were my age at the time, that was, that was the thing. We had mm -hmm. never seen Shakespeare done like that before. And, you know, and you had um, just this incredibly diverse, interesting cast, um, you know, Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio had this like bonkers chemistry. And when you're 14 and you see that, you're like, oh my God, right. I'm like, how, <laughs> wanna, did, how wanna... does that, does that happen in real life? Um, you know, and so that, that, and it was such a high art form in terms of the way that, you know, the Bob Lerman's high stylized um, look, those things kind of aligned for me in this way that I was like, this art thing that I love to do on stage is something that can be applied elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I started to sort of just be hyper aware of these things and, and track them a little bit more closely. So I think, you know, in terms of, you know, a, a young woman who really stood out to me, Claire Danes was, was that she had been in my so-called life when I was a kid and she, she, she still was, is that. Oh my God, it's so good. And she, you know, and then she was, you know, Juliet and it, that she was just kind of the, the acting, you know, goddess for us, for, for my age group and um she, again that was sort of a when I became aware of that this is something you can do for a living mm -hmm. and working with people who are able to do that thing is also something I can do for a living so that was kind of it for me what do you think that is though you know you see especially now you've seen thousands of actors come across mm -hmm. you but I'm gonna go there with the it right what do you, if you had to describe what that is, because I believe each and every one of us has something magical. You know, I think it can be very vague and like, well, I guess I'm just not made for this business. Well, there's something that we all uniquely bring. So for you, what do you think that that thing is? Is it a, is it a knowing of self for you? Is it a, is that awareness, confidence? Yeah, it's definitely a, a knowing of self. And I think it's also a knowing of what is unique about you? And it doesn't have to be a skill, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's part of your story. What is unique about your story? Where you're from? Like for example, again, I'm not an actor, but you know, I'm 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 a Jewish girl from North Dakota. That's pretty unique in the general scheme of things, right? Um, so that my experience there is something that I would you know, bring forward in my art. I reference it. I still talk, you know, even though I'm not an actor, I'm not using it for my craft necessarily. It is a huge part of my identity, huge part. Mm -hmm. And I think embracing your lived experiences, whatever they be, good, bad, ugly, fabulous, amazing, whatever, is part of your gift. Mm -hmm. And the thing that actors do, that the rest of us, are too scared to do, um, is that you access it. 
Mm -hmm. right? You use the things that may have hurt you, traumatized you, um, scarred you, and you change them in a way that you, that you make them work for you ultimately. And like I said, a lot of the rest of us are too afraid (laughs) to, um, constantly access that stuff. And I think that's what makes actors so unique as artists and, and the craft itself so difficult is that you have to be completely fearless. You have to be brave and not to say that you absolutely have to use your past traumas, but you can, Mm -hmm. you can. You You can give them that power. You can, it's like, for me, I I look at it like taking the power back from the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know it's, it's can be scary. And I think that's where we're, we're training and craft comes in and how to safely, like when I coach, I'm like, like I do the exercise where I peel myself off and then I put Christine is safe. She's here. I can come back to Christine who's safe there and step into whoever else I'm playing. Um, and that's, I think self-trust also is huge. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and just, you know, having a, an outlet for when that stuff piles up and, you know, you've, you've used it so much or buried it so much that it's now impacting this other emotional access for you. Um, mm-hmm. you know, ha- just having the, the community and the, um, the safety to know that you can, talk about it whenever you need to talk about it, use it whenever you need to use it, put it away when you want to put it away. And all of that is okay. All of that is appropriate for this yeah. craft. I love that. Speaking of what makes us magnetic and magical, mm-hmm. what yes. does Erica know? And she, when a project comes across her desk, why is it that people are calling you to why work? They, why are they calling me? Yeah, oh, what, God, is it that you, um. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you do? bring to to the things that you do now well I like to think that I bring um I mean for better or for worse I uh I'm a I am a little bit uh of a control freak (laughs) um and then let me reframe that as a positive for a second um (laughs) um my with that I mean that I there's nothing that I am on that I don't have a part in, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not, dele- I mean, I need to delegate more, frankly, to um, my wonderful assistant who I love and can't survive without. Um, but I am making sure that in terms of the craft, nothing is getting sent forward that doesn't pass muster or that I don't think is going to make it where it needs to go or do what it needs to do or show that actor in a light that is going to be a positive for them. So I, I like to, um, really curate what I send to my producers, um, heavily curate by, in terms of the materials that I'm sending forward on a, on a single actor. I do work sessions with actors over zoom to make sure that we're getting a take that's going to align with their taste or the tone of the project. If it's, if we've not already gotten that via self tape. And I, you know, I, I write my own breakdowns. I do a lot of that stuff okay. that, yeah, that, that a lot of people um, are very wise <laughs> to have some, some help with. Um, but for me, I'll, I'll, that stuff is my craft, right? Like that, there, there's so much about casting that is boring. <laughs> so much. We have mountains of paperwork we have to do for every person we hire. I mean, it was... Yeah. So boring. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, the data reports that we have to do, the, um, you know, pulling sides, things like that. There, there are, there is just a, just a ton of paperwork. You'd be stunned how much paperwork we do. The Taft Hartleys that we have to do. And then the contract and the deal memos and the different communications and the, you know, the, the conference calls and all of these things that we have to do that are important and they they're necessary to our job, but they aren't so much craft, right? Right. For me, anything that is craft related, I got my hands all over it. Like I guess this is my my sweet spot right here. It's it's (laughs) why I chose to do it. So I, you know, that stuff, while it might be tedious or time consuming for, for me to not delegate it, it's also fun for me. Um, I enjoy doing it and I enjoy taking the time to really make sure that what I'm sending forward 
is showing everything in the best possible light, showing the actors in the best possible light, showing these producers what I can find from this market in the best possible way. Um, and just showing them that like, yes, our tastes do align and I can take a note if you have it and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that stuff is really important to me. And I think, you know, in terms of why people, people might be calling me, um, you know, a lot, of, I, I spent 17 years in LA. So I, I learned my craft from a lot of the people who have been doing this for a really long time at a very high level in a very busy market. Mm -hmm. Um, and I take that stuff with me sort of wherever I go. So even though I'm in a different market and sometimes even though I'm based here in the Southeast now, I'm still doing stuff in LA. Sometimes I'm covering New York. Sometimes I'm covering all of North America. <laughs> um, I take that with me no matter which market I'm looking into. Um, and that is, that's my craft. That's my jam. That's why I choose to do this thing and put up with the mountains of paperwork that we have to do. That's the fun stuff. Balances out, yeah, balances out. Hey, what's up? It's Christine Horn, the booking magnet. I am so excited to invite you to our next event. It is called Booking Magnet Live. It's happening in Atlanta, Georgia on July 15th and 16th, 2022. You're gonna spend two days surrounded with actors oh, just like you. Actors who want more, actors who are looking for a safe space, a sanctuary, a safe haven to express themselves, to learn, to grow, and to connect. So I'm excited for you to experience that. Make sure you join us July 15th and 16th. You can click the link below, and I'm so excited to see you there. You know, you've also taken a bold, I'm going to call it a bold, stance in cre creating a blog like you're not afraid to express your opinion well it doesn't appear that you're afraid to express your opinion and as someone who also does that it, it can I think when you make the decision to express yourself you open yourself up for criticism for feedback for praise you know a bit of everything um how do you balance that I know for me <laughs> I'm learning oh more people are know who I am because I'm starting to get some feedback and that sure. and I have to take the good and the bad and yeah. who it's for who is who is for so how do you balance that being public because you you share a lot of helpful stuff but and you share it with love but you're going to share it with tr with truth too so how do you balance that and and not care so much what that feedback might be like if in case it's a little negative sure so it, first of all it took me a really long time to, to be comfortable with that a really long time. Um, and it started by being in a, in working with a casting director who um, encouraged me to speak up. Mm -hmm. She would, when I worked with, I worked with April Webster for 10 years, 11 years, I think 10 years before I moved. And she would turn to me and say, what do you think? And she would, she would encourage me to speak up. She would encourage me to say in the room, do you think we got it? Is there anything else? She would she would always encourage me to do that. And man, the first couple times I did it, I was terrified, terrified. And if ever I did it without being prompted, I was like, oh my God, are they going to be so mad at me? You know, like I, it took a really, really long time. And I think for anybody who is working on using their voice for anything like this, right? For it to, to put material out into the world, to talk on social media, to do whatever, um, it's okay that that's a process. Yeah. You don't have to just be like, I'm doing this now and 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 everything's going to be peachy keen and it's going to be great. It's, it takes some time. And for me, as I have grown into my adult self, I have just started reprioritizing things, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas this, you know, negative commentary may have been felt really hurtful to me in another part of my life. Now I can look at it with a different perspective. And then I can go and look at my little 10 month old child who just learned how to pull himself up in his crib and he's waving at me from his crib. And like, and I can be like, this is what matters to me, this thing on the internet, whatever, right? So, but it takes time, that doesn't happen overnight. And I think the, um, for me, one of the reasons I started doing it is that I was constantly running into actors who were talking to me about how awful casting directors were um, 
and how they were the barriers and how terrible they were in the room. And they, I mean, I would, the complaints yeah. from these actors of just like how they felt that, um, we weren't on their side and we weren't ever going to see shows anymore. And we weren't finding people organically anymore. And like all of these things. And I thought these people have just have no idea. They have no idea what we do. They have no idea what our process is like. They're just uninformed. So that's my, my, the reason I started the the blog post also, you know, that kind of aligned with me having my first child and having more time on my hands. Yeah. But, um, but it just, was one of those things where I was like, let's make this easier. Let's make it so that if somebody's like, I wonder what this is like, or I wonder what this process is about, they could literally Google it and find an answer. Right. Right. So, so that's why I started it was just to normalize some things, clarify some things, pull the curtain back a little bit so that people understood what it is that we do in service of actors, which is what we do. I mean, every single day we are, we are, you know, we're hired of course by the productions and, and they are our employers, but we are working with actors, we, you know, outside of your reps who of course have to be your big cheerleaders. We are your biggest, and your parents and your family, yeah. of course, we are your biggest cheerleaders, right? Cause we are encouraging our employers to employ you as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the idea that we are the barrier to success, that we are the enemy of the actor, um, that we are lazy because we ask for self tapes instead of doing in-person auditions, you know, whatever, all of that stuff is just, I think it comes from this place of unknowing. Yeah. So, you know, that I had a very specific goal in mind when I started doing it. And so the, comments, you know, when they are negative or constructive or what, you know, whatever word you want to use to call them. I call them um, when the, when the keyboard gangsters show up. Oh man. <laughs> oh, it can just, and it's, you know, it, and it can really ruin your day, you know? Um, but you know, for me, I found that like, if one person has something negative to say about this thing and the other 10 are appreciative of the information, I'm going to focus on those 10. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that's really all you can do. That is exactly, that's a word for me too. And, and I've had to lean into it. I mean, it's like, I, it's, I've seen the results that have come. That's, yeah. you make your own decision. I'm not, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. You're not everybody's cup of tea. It's totally. like, totally. you have, it's free will. You can go and <laughs> Issa Rae, the actress, she'll say, mute me, block me, unfollow me, do what you need to do. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> You totally. have that choice. Yep. Yep. You know, I think also, it's, and I'm just in thinking back to my younger self, plus the hundreds of actors I've coached at this moment. I think what I often hear at the core is like a lack of trust with okay. casting. Yeah. The trust that, the lack of trust in, did you really watch my self tape? Like you see, you have thousands, you have a hundred, like you're not watching them. Like there's no way. Like I think, <laughs> I and it's, I don't know how, how much more people you casting can, can prove that. And I think it's mixed with hearing casting. The sooner you get it in, Oh, we already, we got early submissions. They got sent to producers. We stopped watching, you know, maybe one person said it. And now there's this story that gets replayed that you know, you're not on my side. Like you, I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. And I'm always encouraging, like, this is an opportunity, like for yourself, like even more than yeah. anything. So what can you offer? I mean, you, you say it all the time and y'all, I'm going to have all of Erica's links in the show notes. So don't worry, you're going to find all the things, but just if you were to leave a nugget on how can that trust be, be built a bit more? What do you, or what needs you know, to shift in the, in the in the dynamic of the relationship? You know, I think, again, I, I've said this before, um, but there's, there's no way a casting director can get into casting without loving actors. We, uh, literally our day revolves around you that's true <laughs> day watching you talking about you working on your deal points putting our, your paperwork into the union like we literally our day revolves around you can you imagine <laughs> this is the sound bite right <laughs> <laughs> right can you imagine what torture we would be putting ourselves through if we didn't love actors right and i think 
the, um, you know, part of my insistence of, of taking part in social media, which is sometimes so taxing and so time consuming, um, but it's so that people can see that we're real, right? Mm -hmm. We are real people. And of course, since the pandemic and so many casting directors are still working from home, um, mm -hmm. you know, people, I think, forget that there's somebody on the other side of the internet who's excited about you. It just feels so vague, right? But it's still us. And we're still doing this because we love it, because we love to watch performances, because we love to direct performances, because we love to introduce performers to other creatives, um, because we love to put the puzzle together. We That's why we do this. It is not for the pay, which is just <laughs> just you would be appalled um <laughs> it's certainly not for the accolades as everybody knows we we have to give ourselves awards we're you know only right. making small inroads into some of the other um award programs BAFTA finally just I something. cannot but believe it, after of all of course you know the academy nothing um so you know it, it's not for those things it's not for the pay or the accolades it is because this is this is our craft and we love it. So I think if you can remember that even, you know, if things change and we have to send tapes forward earlier than we anticipated, or um, we are maybe a little curt or cold to you the next time that we see you or whatever, it's not because we don't like actors. It's because we've got all kinds of other things going on. We are trying to get a job done right by a certain deadline and meet the needs of the production while still engaging fully in our craft. So that is what I try to remind actors is that even though it feels so lonely, especially these days when everything is still virtual and whatever, yeah. there is somebody on the other side of the internet who's excited to see your work. Oh, I love this so much. That's why I wanted you on this podcast. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, your energy oozes just from your Instagram page. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. truly. And I've met a lot of casting directors. You know, there's a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of personalities, right? Totally. Very wide ranging. Right. And, but it's, it's, it's just what I knew. And so you only solidify what I already felt. Thank um, you. We're going to, we're, we're going to wrap up. In a, in a moment, but this is, this is a question I've asked everyone, you know, sure. and from your perspective, you know, ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. The one thing that's consistent about this industry is the inconsistency. Amen. Uh, so I'm always talking about, of course, getting better, enjoying life as a human being, <laughs> right? Um, but from the outside looking in, what have been some of the things that you see are good ideas for actors to balance the ebb and flows. So the ebb and flow could be just a dry spell for six months or a couple of years, or it just could be you got, you've been pinned five times. I mean, been there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and released and released. And you're just dealing with like, just, just, this is too much. Like any advice or maybe other actor friends you have, like how, how do they balance this? So, uh, you know, I always recommend that actors find a way to keep their fire lit, right? Because if you're waiting on the validation of a booking, it, don't be waiting. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that's you just don't want to wait on that, right? Plus, the booking may come and it may not be the most fun job you ever do, which doesn't help the old self-esteem. So, so again, I don't put stock in that, right? So in in regular times you have to find a way to keep your fire lit and there are so many different ways actors do that and it really depends on why you got into this in the first place right um for some people being in class being challenged in class does it for some people writing and creating outside of their bookings and you know with a group or on their own or whatever that does it for some people being on stage does it getting back into theater even if you're in la and it pays you a high five you know like Maybe that's what you need to do to keep your fire lit. You know, the there is so many different things that you can do to make sure that the creative passion is always there and not contingent upon auditions or bookings. And that is so important because you are a million percent correct that this industry 
ebbs and flows. One season, they're looking for all of this one type. The next season is all this type. And then mm -hmm. it goes back and forth. My very first year that I worked with Ronnie at um, Yes Call, that season, every single network had a sci-fi show. <laughs> every single show got canceled. And the next season, there were no sci-fi shows. So that that's the thing, right? Is that it's... It's, it, it comes and goes, it changes. That's always gonna be how it is. And so how can you make sure that you are remain creative and passionate even when it's quiet? Mm -hmm. and, and as long as you have that thing, whatever it is, if it's reading scripts, if it's just watching your favorite show on Netflix to re be reminded, you know, this was the thing that lit my fire originally, whatever, you just need that thing. That's so good. That's so good. That's so good. Do you, you know, huh? Do you have a thing? I have many things. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm you talk about the control freak, a little bit of a workaholic, you know, <laughs> just a little, a little bit. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> you know, I've always loved to produce things ever since I was a kid, you know, writing, directing. I mean, I was the eight year old you know, dragging her friends to create a late night talk show in my bedroom. Like, like that was me. So, so as I've grown up, you know, that's what I do, even with coaching or like putting on a conference or making a video, like I just love to create. Right. And what I've learned and, and I'm always reminded of that no one gets to take that away from me. Like that's the gift I was given, you know? And I, I get, I mean, Lord knows I've had ups and downs like everybody else, but I'm like, just because that's a no over there, it's not a no to me, Christine. 100%. Yeah. You know, how I'll never forget there was a project. I won't say the casting director's name here in the Southeast, but it was one of those. They just knew I, it, was, it was me. They were like, it's just you. They just, the producer just has to sign off, right. flew right. last minute, all the, all the things. And then still, they went, when I tell you, they went a whole different direction. <laughs> and I, I mean, they're like, you didn't want a black woman. Well, why? <laughs> It was so down to the wire. Like we, everybody thought it was a shoe in, but I never forget hearing from my, from my agent, shout out to Houghton Talent in Atlanta. And they expressed like the, how bad casting felt, like how truly bad casting felt to have to even deliver that news. What are some ways that Erica releases when it's one of those, when you were, you were in the fight right along with, with the agent and with the, with the talent? How does Erica heal herself and, and release that? Um, it I'm not good at it is the answer to that question. Um, I My very first pilot that I ever worked on, I was 22 years old, and we fell in love with this actor for the lead, the series lead. And he, um, I mean, he's wildly established now, but at the time he was really young and, and he'd only like just come out of drama school and had maybe one or two credits. And we tested him. So he got all the way to the network and the network was like, uh, anybody else? And he was the guy. I mean, he had gone through so many rounds. We all loved him. The creative team was like, he is the guy. This is the guy. And we hired somebody else who was a little bit more of a name. And I remember I called my mom. I was 22. So young and naive. And I was like, this is bullshit. I'm getting out of this industry. There's so much politics in this. It's not about art, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And my mom was like, oh, honey, there's politics in everything. And I was like, oh, and sure enough, <laughs> that's completely accurate. Also, um, the experience of going that, that similar experience comes up all the time, all the time. Right. And it's never not frustrating yeah. and it's never not heartbreaking. And especially when you, we've really sort of strung them along and it seemed like this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. It's just a matter of one more yes and then it's a no. It's, it's devastating, you know? Um, you know, and then also for us as casting directors, it means that we have to go back and look again or start over or whatever. And so it's it's just deeply frustrating on so many levels. And, you know, for me, the, the, 
you know, your to your question of how do you release, I don't. <laughs> you gotta work on that, okay? Like, I, I hold on to it. I hold on to it until finally, like, I walk out. Of, I have to walk away, right? Like, I walk away from my computer, walk away from my phone, walk outside, talk to my husband, see my kids, something so that I can disengage from that for a second. Because when you're in it, it feels so personal. Everything about it feels personal. And it's not, you know, it's not me that they're hiring, but it's this person that I loved that they're refusing to hire that feels so personal. So it's, it really takes walking out and seeing that there are other things going on in the world, right? It's seeing that there, I've got my kids out here and they're hungry and they need dinner and do we want to have a family dinner? That helps me. Um, just walking outside, waving at a neighbor, you know, whatever, anything like that, that is all helpful. Venting. Yeah. This is again, why my sweet, sweet assistant, I can't live without her. Poor thing. Here's me vent all the time. Um, so, you know, just, just getting it out and then having this moment of, okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's disappointing, but it's, it's almost like you have to go through this, the stages of grief quickly. Yeah. And then because you got to get back, right? You got to go back to work, you know. Yeah. Because if they're saying no to this person, that means that you might have to start over again, unless there's another person that was in there too. But, right. um, you know, so it's it's that. And then if they, you know, if it's between two people, generally speaking, we love both. So you know, while it we may be like, oh, we really love this, but this one's great too. Mm -hmm. Um, that that's fine. It's when they they just completely you know change direction on you, and you're like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, similarly, it's like when they promise an actor on set, like, oh my gosh, we love you. We're writing so much for you. And then they never bring the actor back. It's, you know, that stuff is equally devastating, Yeah, you know, and hard to process. And, you know, it's like this, this promise or hope of, of something just kind of evaporates. And um, that's why I think it's important for any actor for your, the, you know, the sake of your self-worth that you don't pin it all on a single job, right? right? Um, it's not about that one thing. It's, you know, it's, it's about your overall career, your, your advancement as an artist. And, you know, this thing may not have turned out the way you wanted it to, but maybe the next thing is going to be better. And maybe you learn something from that thing that you want to take into the next job. And all of that is important. You know, that all of that um, contributes to your artistic growth and to your artistic career. And then just know that it's normal. Yeah. You know, I think remembering that this happens all the time, not just to you, to me, to whatever. It's not personal. It's not. It feels super personal, but it's yeah. not. Y'all, you, you're hearing it here first. If you, ha if you haven't really absorbed it, I hope you, you really are understanding how this relationship works and how the business that you've chosen works. Mm -hmm. Because when you get too tired of it, you can always step, I, was, I tell people, step back. Yes. Step back. It's, it is not going anywhere. Never, never will. Always <laughs> going to be here. Always going to be here. That's why so, so anytime somebody's like, oh my God, is it too late to me for me to start acting? I'm like, too late for what? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think is going to happen? To the, is, do you think film is going to go away? Right. Of course not. No, not at all. Yeah. Erica, hang out. I'm going to say, we're going to get ready to sure. wrap. Don't hang up when we stop because I want to take okay. a picture with you. Okay. But I have to thank you for your transparency, for your love, for your energy. And for the work you're doing and giving actors opportunities, you know, y'all make sure you follow Erica. She always drops gems, especially on the gram. Read her podcast. Again, all the links will be in the show notes. Erica, any last words? You've said so much, but before this last piece, the last piece of Erica, anything else you want to just pour into the heart of the, of the, of the actor watching you right now? Um, yes, this is my sort of final word of encouragement. Um, the news is sort of a daily onslaught of bad news. <laughs> um, and I think as artists, you are all empaths and you feel these things. You, you feel when you see pictures of the war in Ukraine, you feel when you see things about people's rights being taken away and things like that. And it's important that you use it for your art, but also know how to process through it so that it doesn't sit on you 
if it's not important to that role, right? So find a way, if you need a minute to process before you go back to that tape, or you need, um, you know, some time to, to go out and, you know, knock on some doors and get yourself out and, and do something to help you sort of process your way through whatever you're seeing, that's really important. You have to give yourself that space because you are all very in touch and in tune with your emotions. <laughs> and if the bad news of the world is breaking your heart and you're trying to read for a waitress that says, can I take your order? You don't want that to sit on you. Right? right? Like, this is heavy. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's not a sad waitress. <laughs> so, you know, you need to make sure that you're finding outlets for those things because between pandemics and illnesses and healthcare costs and all of the other things that can really sit on your heart, you have to find a way to process your way through it so that you can allow your emotions to come and go as needed given the specific thing that you're working on. Um, so make sure that you give yourself that space because I think every time, you know, we've got little you know, constant news feeds coming in at us. And it can just be hugely distracting and, you know, just really hard to live with. <laughs> so find that space for yourself. You know, you, actors are always like, people tell me not to be so emotional, but like, that's your job. <laughs> it is your job to be emotional and to be in touch with your emotions. But as such, it means that you also feel things quite deeply. So, you know, find that space for yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, whatever it is, whether it's a good news day, bad news day, or anything in between, that you have an outlet, journaling, therapy, walking with a friend, whatever. Do something to give yourself that space so that you can use it when you need it and put it aside as needed as well. I love that. That takes me back to someone said, there's, there's peace in a pause. Mm. Sometimes you just need to pause. Yeah. Yeah. You can borrow that. <laughs> Erica has been, thank you for being on Booking Magnet Magic. You are magical. You are magnetic. Y'all need to feel some of this to take, borrow some of that and bring it to your own life. Thank you so much. I will see you soon. Thank you all for watching. If you miss any part of this series, get your life and come watch this series. Yes. I mean, get we are it. speaking to your heart and to your soul, and I hope you receive that. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.